Left, right, left nation, we're back. I am still your handsome host, the AKA the Silver Fox, Mark Archibald, United States Marine Corps, retired, here with an awesome, awesome episode tonight that we'll get to in a minute. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping notes. Remember my uh, partner out there, the Amphibious Tractor Memorial. All proceeds will be donated to the to their cause. Uh, proud to sit as a chairman uh, over there on that board. Really excited to uh, to partake that. So please continue to mash that subscribe button, mash that like, all those good things to help me out. All right. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and hit this. Tonight is going to be what I would classify as a somber, um, but uplifting and motivating story. I got a set of brothers here with me tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Josh Gehring, for connecting me with the Marquez brothers. They're out there taking action, uh, looking after Gold Star families, and finding ways to continue to share the stories of those who died in combat. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce everybody to Manny. Stick your hand up, brother. That's Manny Marquez right there. And brother Anthony Marquez, welcome to the show, gentlemen. I appreciate your time tonight. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to get started with uh, we'll turn back the clock. Uh, I think it's important for everybody to know a little bit about you guys before we get into actually what you're doing today. So, Anthony, over to you, sir. I grew up in Oklahoma and grew up on 60 acres, always doing stuff out and like fishing and doing stuff out, helping my dad in the, in the shop and um, just tinkering. And uh, as I got older, learning how to weld and building weird creations with metal and some type of engine and, and uh, just kind of like a quiet, quiet country life outside of the city. Um, but uh, I always had this desire to join the Marine Corps and uh, after my uncle who was a Marine as well. So. That's awesome. Manny, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Um, I have been a filmmaker for about 25 years now. Um, grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm Anthony's older brother. I always grew up wanting to like watching TV, wanting to like make my own Star Trek episodes and, you know, my own little war films and stuff. And, and, uh, basically kind of just fell in love with storytelling. I kind of at one time considered the priesthood considered, um, the military actually. And, um, and, but the storytelling kept, kept pulling at me and ended up going to California and living out West for about 23 years before coming back to Oklahoma. Awesome. Uh Anthony, a quick follow-up for you, sir. So you joined the Marine Corps. Uh, what made you want to join and tell everybody a little bit about your service? Uh, so both of our grandfathers served in the Army, uh, both of them during World War II and then one during World War II and Korea. And then uh, my Uncle Robert was a big uh, influence on my decision to join the Marine Corps. Uh, he was in the Marine Corps early 80s, late 70s, early 80s time frame. Uh, stationed in Japan. Uh, he was the third tank, tank battalion. Um, so it's just ever since I was probably about six years old, that's, that's what I had set my mind on doing. And when, and then during my junior and senior year, that's what I did. I joined, uh, and then I was in the, the depth for a year. And then, uh, 11 days after I graduated high school, I went to, uh, MCRD and that's where I went to boot camp. And, and then, uh, graduated boot camp. September of 2007, and then I went three years. I was with the security forces on the East Coast, and uh, I was with 2F5 and 1F3. I went to Cuba with 2F5, and I went to Spain and Israel with 1F3, and, uh, and then I PCS, and I went to uh, first time 5th Marines in 2010, and, and we did the workup uh, that whole year, and then we deployed to Sangin, in Afghanistan 2011 from April till October of 2011, and, and then I came back five months later i got out of the marine corps i uh, did the burp the early release program and i got out about three months four months before my actual contract um just quick context uh anthony so were you in uh 0311 or yeah well i was i was 0311 i was security forces yeah. so the building of security forces you have to do five-year contracts yeah. so you got to do three years with the security force unit and then uh two years with the line okay there. so that's why I was, I was 0311 and then I was, uh, the Marine Corps had the program, the IDD, uh, dog program and I got selected to be an IDD dog handler. Uh, and I went to school and 
October, November of 2010. Okay, awesome. So you deployed the Sang in Afghanistan, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. That was a, uh, a hellacious deployment, to say the least. Um, from what I can recall, um, 17 were killed in action, to include one of the Marines was one of your best friends, and then over 190 wounded, just up there, you know, hooking and jabbing, you know, with, with the enemy. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, that your experience there? In one five in Sangin, yeah, um, it was at the time. It was there was a period of like four years or so that Sangin was known as one of the deadliest regions in Afghanistan, and um, so you know we replaced three five. They had twenty five KIA and multiple wounded, and uh, and then we replaced them in April of two thousand eleven. And uh, and then we were there, you know, we were there for the summer months, so which were rough. Especially June was pretty rough. We lost nine Marines during that that month, and uh, so uh, that was my first combat deployment. I did two prior deployments. I always say I did three deployments: two non-combat, one combat, because I went to Cuba for three months, and then we just stood post on the fence line and mm-hmm. over to. Uh, rode to Spain with it, it for nine months, and we forward deployed to Israel and trained with Israelis and came back. And then that's when you know the the, the Afghanistan deployment was the combat deployment. And, um, yeah, it was a pretty rough place. I mean, as anybody knows who would something like that. When I understand that um, there was a so, that there was a little seed that was planted there, Lieutenant Colonel yeah, Savage, your battalion yeah. commander at the time, said something that was very impactful to you. Yeah, I was just thinking about this the other day. And I was like, I mean, at the time, I wasn't, it wasn't processing in my mind to be like, well, what can I do? What do I need to do? It was years later that something occurred that I actually put everything together and went and did continue to do what we do now. Um, but yeah, I held the flag at uh, Greninger's memorial service five days after he was killed. Uh, at the time, uh, Major General Savage now, he's Lieutenant Colonel, who's our battalion commander. He said he died for millions of Americans who will never know his name. And uh, so, now what we're doing as a film crew together um, is something that's going to make sure that that doesn't happen for all of them. Absolutely. And you said, Anthony, at the time that you didn't realize that, you know, that that was your call to action. So you transitioned out of the Marine Corps a short while later. Um, Was there like a light bulb moment for you where you're like, I got to get into action and get into motion? you know, and do something, you know, to help the healing. Um, so, so I got out in March of 2012 and then there was a few things I was involved with, with helping veterans. And, and I actually went to and visited Greninger's grave, I think in, I think it was 2013 or early 14, I think it was. And I gave, a, I had a friend of mine paint, uh, do this painting of St. Michael and I gave it to Greninger's mother and, um, so I was always trying to like get involved in something regarding veterans and I did a few things for the Gold Star family and um but it it wasn't until two thousand sixteen that it was like, Okay, I need to do something something for all of them. Kind of. Yeah, and what was that what was that that you did, you know, to present the families and how you embarked on um, the journey? So in two thousand May of two thousand sixteen, uh Greninger's mother attempted suicide, and I got word of it. Uh, a friend of the family uh, reached out to me and told me about it, and I was trying to figure out what what I could do. Um, I was like, I need to do something for her. Or I, you know, I, I feel like I need to do something for her. And um, so it just came to me. I was like, well, like I said, I grew up always tinkering and doing like welding and building little go karts and mopeds and. And I wanted to do something that nobody had ever done before. And I was like, well, okay, I'm going to do a carving. I'm going to do a chainsaw carving of the image of the battlefield cross, so the rifle, the helmet, the boots. And um, I was like, I'm going to deliver it to her. So um, I found a guy online, reached out to him. <clears throat> um, and he's he's like, well, you're not really picking a beginner piece. You know, you need to start with these other And I was like, well, I mean, this is what I want to do. So two months went by. I didn't do anything with it. And then it was about about five days before I was going to Minnesota to see his family. And I called Clayton back, the guy I had initially reached out to. And I went and bought a log and then took it over to his house and him and I carved it together. And, and then 
I drove it through the night to Minnesota and gave it to Brenner's mom, uh, his family on July 12, 2016. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so that was a very cool car. And then uh, from that point, I was like, well, I need to do it for all of them. I got to do it for their 16 other families. So that's what started the journey of the carvings. Uh, just under three years, I drove like 46,000 miles uh, in the hand labor. I've stood at all 17 Marines grave and given them carvings. And there's five head, five Marines headstones are at Arlington. They're scattered all throughout the country. The rest Very, of the that's awesome, man. Taking, taking action steps, you know, to close some distance with those gold star families and let them know they're not forgotten about. Um, I'm going to pivot over to Manny. So Manny, at what point did, you know, yourself being a filmmaker, at what point did, you know, you kind of feel as though, hey, there's an opportunity here, you know, or or how can we, you know, make turn this turn these actions, you know, into films so other people can learn from them and inspire other people? Uh, in 2014, and I'm sorry, I lost my voice this week, so it's just coming back. Um, in 2014, Anthony uh, was seeking a way to adopt Allie, his dog that he had in Afghanistan. And he had discovered that she was coming up for adoption because she had been through four deployments. And he being her first handler, he was given the opportunity. It just kind of fell into place. He was looking for a way to adopt her. And then she came up for adoption and they reached out to her. And so we we put that into action, as you would say, like, let's go get the dog. You know, and, and I came with the camera and we started filming. And um, we spent seven days filming. And that became a short film, Operation Alley. And that shopped around a couple of film festivals and uh, did well, was nominated for quite a few awards. Um, during that time, 2015, 20, you know, during that time up until like 2019, he was doing the carvings and delivering them. But I was busy having kids and working and making other films. And um, in 2019, right, we did 17 carvings. 2017, we did a short film called 12, 17 Carvings. And it was the delivery of one of the battlefield crosses to the um, Marceau family, Joe Jackson's family. And Joe Jackson was the first one killed on the deployment. And he was in Yakima, Washington, near where I lived in Hood River, Oregon. And so we filmed that. And that became a short film, five-minute film, and it did really well. And then around 2020, um, Anthony said, you know, are we, we need to make a feature film about all these families. Like, I don't want it to be about what I'm doing. I want it to be to give a voice to these Gold Star families. And I want to give a name to these men so that these 17 are never forgotten. Well, then, as we know, COVID hit and, and the world kind of shut down. And some of these families are older or elderly. And we're like, we shouldn't responsibly get on the road and do this in 2020. And so we waited a year. And we really wanted to have already started it because we were trying to be well into it by the 10th anniversary of their deaths, which was 2021. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't get to start the movie until July 12th. 2021, um, the day of Greninger's KIA day. And from there, we, we went, we knew that was when we were going to make a feature film and not even COVID would stop us then. We just, we rented an RV. We got on the road for 40 days. We went 12,000 miles, 37 states. And, and, <laughs> you know, but that's when we started the movie. Wow. And just so. to let all the viewers know, um, the placard that you see in front, uh, of the, um, of the brothers says make peace or die. That is indeed the name of the film. That is going to be released, I assume, is Make Peace or Die 17 in honor of the 17 that were killed in action in 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, and sang in Afghanistan when Anthony was deployed. Um, so, Manny, as far as the film goes, um, I know that there's a lot that goes into it and stuff, but could you first and then Anthony talk about kind of some of the challenges of actually making Making the film, like you said, 40 days on the road, you know, you got all this miles you're trying to rack up. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, please? Well, the biggest challenge is the emotional aspect, because, you know, I mean, as much as Anthony wanted to make their names known, Anthony didn't want to be the hero. He didn't want to draw the attention to himself. But I, like I said, I've been a filmmaker for 25 years and I'm a documentarian at heart and we all know in a documentary, you have to have a hero. And I'm using that term as a storytelling element. You have to have someone to follow, right? It's, it's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you follow that person through the story. And so I told Anthony, like, the only way this is going to work is if you guide us through it. So Anthony had, he had to give up. No, it wasn't pride at all. It was his own humility to go, okay, I'll do it. Cause he wanted to just go interview the families. And I'm like, that won't work as a movie. That'll just be a video. Sure. 
And so the one thing we decided was we weren't, and this is no dig on anybody. There's a lot of great content on YouTube and on the internet of guys that go and interview their units or, or their fellow buddies or whatever, but they're not films. They're not cohesive films. They're, they're interviews, they're good stories, but we wanted to make a, a piece of cinema that if you were against the war, you may still go see this and say, you know what? I'm going to have empathy for that person. It might change my thinking. And if you were a flag waving, you know, patriot, you may say, you know what? That made me realize that it's not just, uh, you know, a, a, a rah rah political thing. It's, it's people are losing their lives. And it, we wanted to meet, we wanted everyone to meet in the middle. We wanted to make a movie that America could sit in the movie theater together and they would, they would feel empathy for these families. And they would understand that these guys need healing and they, and maybe they would be there for them. Mm-hmm. And so like the hard part for us was making a movie that was non-political, but still um, truthful. Yes. It, still truthful. Too. Yeah. That was the hard part because if we may, if we went in it with a political bent, we would be divisive right. already. And and if you remember, we were making this movie at the time of the, of the withdrawal. Right. Yeah. And so it was already, it was already, a, um, Another element we hadn't planned on. Yeah, you know? very charged so, time. Yeah, so I don't, yeah, so I think some of the some of the to recap, getting Anthony to say I'll be the hero, um, and then and then just strapping in and, and saying we're going to do this no matter the emotions, and you know, and then lastly raising the money. That's been a challenge which we're still on. So okay. you know, Anthony, yeah. challenges over to you. Anything that kind of sticks out to you? Um. There's been quite a few challenges. I mean, actually, the road trip for the amount of people that we saw and spoke to and met with, the road trip went as smooth as possibly as it as it could have. Um, you know, we didn't have any breakdowns. We didn't have any wrecks. We didn't get any horribly bad weather where we were in the ditch. Uh, everybody we were trying to interview, um, you know, we were all the families. We interviewed them. Uh, we interviewed 23 different Marines as well. Like people were finding out we were on the road and they were driving two hours to have dinner with us and they'd sit there and talk. And um, one thing did happen on the road trip is uh, two of the crew got COVID. So that kind of postponed everything for a whole week. We had to shack up in a hotel room in uh, Washington state for six days until they were negative and all this. Anyway, so it just, you know, there's, but it went, Fairly smooth. We almost got robbed in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> we, almost got robbed. we almost got robbed once. Yeah. And uh, so it went, you know, that it, the whole thing was tiring. Um, you're on the road nonstop, you know, the, the RV. So Barry Switzer is a good friend of mine and ours, and he actually got uh, the RV for us. I don't know if you yeah. guys know who head coach. Is. He's, Oklahoma he's, Cowboys. Yeah, he was the head coach. Cowboys. Yeah. So he, he's, he actually, helped me get my dog back too and um and, and then he helped me when i started doing the chainsaw carvings he helped and got involved in that and then when, when i told him we were doing this road trip um i went and had lunch with him and uh me and another friend and i was like yeah i'm probably gonna do it in my truck but we might try to get an rv and he we got back to his house and he jumped on the computer and he started looking up cruise america rvs so he, like he's helped out a lot so he he helped us get the rv um but the you know you're 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 living in an rv you're that's like your command post um, so, but it's still, it's, it's tiring. You're, we're shouting <laughs> at uh, families and Marines houses. And, um, there's just a lot of aspects of it, uh, that are just, uh, you know, challenging in itself. Um, obviously, like Manny said, the stories, emotional, the emotional story side of things. Uh, a lot of the families are talking about things that they don't talk about, uh, to anybody. Um, you know, uh, some of, some of the families give us, 30 minute interview. Some families give us two and a half hour interview and uh, it's, they are really digging into stuff because the way Manny does it is he sits down and has a conversation with them. He doesn't, he doesn't bring in a script. He doesn't have a set of questions. He sits down and he just is on a personal level and, and talks to them and tries to see, you know, what they want to share and where the story goes from there, um, which that, that is a great way to do things. And, uh, but it's a lot of people are talking about stuff that, that I, you know, I didn't know. A lot of people don't know, and that's the whole reason behind the film. People don't know these stories, um, so th- there's that aspect of it. And then, yeah, the financial side of things. It's been, it's been an, for over, about three years now. Just, just that three years of 
I always say like nickel and diamond trying, but we've, we've always had forward progress. I had somebody ask me, well, if you had all the money up front, would the movie been done faster? And I said, yeah. no, probably not. Probably not. Just because stuff takes time. The editorial process took two years, almost. a year and a half. Well, really, a year and a half. yeah, uh, yeah. So, so it just everything takes time, but we've always had forward progress. But it's been very stressful because we didn't know where the money was going to come from. Yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't. Okay, we got to pay for this. But we don't know where it's going to come from. And then something. I met like like I always tell people. I met one of our investors at a stoplight coming home from the gym, and uh, Manny and I, uh, you know, had a meeting with them. Uh, the week after that, later, yeah, yeah we, the week after that, and we sat down and talked to him for two and a half hours, and got got up and shook their hand, and like within five minutes, they called and said, "We're going to be, we're going to invest," you know. So it's it's all, and that's how this whole process has been. It's been it's it's been slow, but uh, yeah. forward progress. It and, never stopped. We never stopped moving forward. Like even if we ran out of money, we would we would we put our own money in to keep the movie going. You know, until we got another donation or another investor, yeah. we never stopped. Like my first movie took ten years to make. My first movie, and it was because we ran out of money. But it was like we're not doing that again. Anthony, I'm like, we're not doing that again. We're not going to spend ten years on this. We're going to keep moving no matter what. We have to sell our car. We're going to keep moving no matter what. Because also, people love are waiting it. to see the movie. Yeah. Love the uh, you know, tenacity. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, just last year, well, one of the one of the Gold Star Fathers. Almost passed away multiple times with heart issues. Uh, another of the Gold Star fathers, he's got uh, dementia and Alzheimer, uh, Parkinson's, really bad. Another of the Gold Star fathers has cancer. I had another Gold Star father call me the day after he almost committed suicide. So the movie is, we're trying to get it done so the families can watch it um, before they get too old. When I was delivering car rings for three years to every family, Every single family said, we're just yes. afraid he'll be forgotten. We're just afraid he'll be forgotten. So after thinking about it, and I was like, well, what's the best way? What can we do? And I was like, well, we, give, we make a movie to give them a platform to tell their side of the story, who their sons were. And that was the thing, too, is like, who knew them the best? Well, their parents did. You know, so we had some family members that were a little upset with us because we didn't spend a week in the with town. With their cousins, and with and their aunts. Right. And it's like, we can't do that. We got it. We have to get the best the story. Who we feel like is best to get the stories from from their parents and those right. who want to speak to us. No, you're you're spot on, man. There's a I have a Gold Star family that I talked to up here in Springfield, Virginia, and the uh, the only there's only three people that still talk to them. And their son um, took his own life in 2014. The Keiko, um, myself, and then my old CEO, and that's it. And they don't really hear from any other people, so. The fact that you guys are understanding that and you embrace it and you're closing that distance with them and indeed giving them something, giving them a memory to, you know, to remember their loved one is just so honorable. And I'm just so happy that you guys, you know, are on this journey. I, I will say if there's anybody hesitant that to reach out to a Gold Star family, you should do it because most of these families want to speak to people Absolutely. who serve with their son and their daughter. It, if you're a veteran and you want to, Reach out to somebody that you know, their family, you should do it because yeah. more than likely Hands they down. want to speak to you. And they would, they would love um, to have a quick, quick question before we get into the premiere. Um, so what, what, what kind of money are you talking about to make, you know, a documentary like you're making? Um, and then how short are you? Cause I can see if I can engage my community and help you out with it. Somewhere around $287,000 we spent making the movie, maybe a little bit more, give or take, give or take. Money like petty cash. Somebody yeah. gives us a hundred bucks here and there, and we yeah. put it in an envelope yeah. of petty cash, and we pay for yeah, you know, stuff like that. So wow. it, it's not two hundred ninety grand, not thousand dollars. But we didn't cut any corners making this movie. You know, that was the thing. Like we we have. I mean, I'm a professional filmmaker. That's my lifeblood. That's my living. But you know, we brought all the cameras we would shoot commercials with, and movies with, and lighting equipment, and like we we didn't cut corners. You know, uh, the editorial team. Our editorial team is. Is been to Sundance ten times. They're cutting movies for Ethan Hawke and HBO, and you know, so like we didn't cut corners. Now we were thrifty. Sure, we were, we were stewards with the money we were given. But you can't, you can't, you cannot make a professional film for three years and not spend two hundred and fifty, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. You know, so um, 
honestly, right now we're we're right. kind of good. We got a donation last week from from a title good. sponsor, Wounded Warrior Outdoors, and um, you know we can always use more money, but we're we're doing okay right now. So, um, you know, we, we do have we do have what we call fiscal sponsorship, which if you do want to donate money, we have a deal with um, the Utah Film Center, and so anybody who donates. Um, you okay. can, we can talk to you later about that. You can link it, but you can donate this tax deductible and they take a okay. little cut and then we get it as a grant. So it's a 501c3. Yeah. So yeah. we're not a 501c3. Yes. We're a film company, but they, they, you know, they help, they help us so we don't have to be a 501c3. So people who want to donate and get the tax okay. credit, they can go that route. And we've, we've, uh, we've had a lot of donations that have come through and yeah. went through the Utah Film Center and, uh, you know, and uh, you know, and then also we have investors okay. in the film. We have nine investors at this point. Uh, fast forward a little bit here. Let's uh, talk two weeks away, May six. The premiere of Make Peace or Die seventeen will go in Old Town, San Diego. From what I understand, sold out, which is really awesome. Uh, so what what can uh, what can they expect when they sit down and watch that film? With with uh, with with making sure you withhold some information, uh, I, you know, to surprise people. But like, what can you sort of, what kind of little bit of insight can you give somebody? Oh, I think people are going to be surprised when they watch it. I think they're going to be taken back by the way we did the story, the way it's told, and you know, a lot of the people that are in the premiere that are coming to the premiere are in the movie. There are Gold Star families. As of right now, we have. 52 Gold Star awesome. family members attending. Uh, Major General Savage, uh, who's the base commander of uh, 29 Palms now. He was our old battalion commander. Um, and then multiple Marines from the unit. And then multiple supporters across the, across the country are flying in. Uh, some of our investors are flying in and just people who support us. And when we say, you know, we've spent all this money, we couldn't have done it without a community of supporters. And we're excited to share that with people. Um, uh, they can expect to learn, learn, learn some things when they watch this. Even the families, I think the families are going to be surprised. And I'm, I hope because it's not like you know you, you can't go there and be like, well, I hope you enjoy the film. It's not right. It's not, it's not an enjoyable okay. film. You know, it's not something yep. you want to go enjoy. It's something you want to learn from. Um, and it's going to be. I think uh, a lot of the families are going to. Uh, be surprised what they learn about some of the other families, because that's the thing too, is kind of like veterans, you know, they're like, Oh, I felt like I was the only one dealing with this. So I felt like I was the only feeling this way, but the families, you know, they, they're struggling, they struggle and, you know, they, they can lean on each other as well. The Gold Star families, they have that community. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that. Uh, totally agree. I think people. Go ahead, Ed, go ahead, Manny. I'm sorry. My biggest, my biggest, well, no, my biggest takeaway is that I think we've achieved our goal, like, A, to make their names known, and B, to give a voice to their families. And and the third thing is, I think we've transcended divides, because I have friends that are in the film world that are, in, in, you know, more left-leaning, and, and their politics will go like, oh, I don't want to watch it, it's a war movie. And then they watch it, and they go, oh, shit, like, man, I, I learned, I mean, I'm getting a little emotional, it's like, I learned something, I didn't realize how I was thinking or how I was treating people or, you know, I, I, I should, my, the, the neighbor down the yes. road has lost their son and I've never talked to them, you know, uh, because of X, Y, Z. And it's like, I'm going to go talk to them, you know? And then I, I, I think, I think people are going to learn, like, I think we've really achieved something that is, and I mean this humbly, like nobody else has done. nobody's made a movie about gold star families like this. There's a lot of movies about PTS, PTSD and, and tra trauma, TBS, blah, 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 you know. Uh, but there's not movies about Gold Star families. There's movies about taking mushrooms to feel better and this and that, yes. weed. And, but there's not movies about this. And, and like, and I think it's a big deal because as I've said from the start, it's a, it's a movie about empathy and healing. And, it, and like Anthony said, it's not entertaining. I mean, it is entertaining because it's a story being told well. But it's, it's not yep. happy. It's a sad story, but it's hopeful. You know, it's a story told well that will make you cry, but it's hopeful. And like, you know, sometimes you need to go into, like Dante, you need to go in the Very depths true. of hell to climb into Eden. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's what you know. 
you know, that's that's what humanity doesn't. We don't as a society now. We just kind of like click on our TikToks and our YouTubes, and we want to skip the hard part. You know, you veterans know the hard part, but I think if people will strap their butts into the movie and sit and go to the depths of hell, then maybe they'll understand their neighbor a little bit more, their fellow American yeah. a little bit more. You know, that, that's, that's huge. That's what I what, what uh, phenomenal you know? you know points that you guys bring up. It, and to me, I know it's not supposed to be a happy movie, and it's not, but it's it's uplifting. Though, um, seeing, you know, gold star families have a voice besides just the one day on the calendar every year, because that is a huge gap in seam that exists out there. I live outside of Quantico, Virginia, and, you know, and, and we, we feel, we feel that same way that you guys feel about it. It's, uh, it's sad. We got to do a better job of staying tied into not just each other. We do a bad enough job just as veterans staying in touch with each other. Great points, gentlemen. I'm, I'm so, uh, moved. About what you guys are doing. I'm fired up. I cannot wait to um, support and see it. So I know you said that you're in a deal right now, you know, for streaming because you're sold out. So not everybody's going to be able to see it. Um, we're going to have, we're going to plan, we're okay. planning a Tulsa premiere, um, hopefully here in the next two months. And then we're yeah. actually trying to do a screening at the museum in Virginia. Um, National Museum of the Marine Corps. We don't have that walked in yet, but we're working on that. So we'll have some other um, festival dates as they cart, they're kind of rolling in. So we'll have some more festival dates across the country. Um, even if we do get a streaming deal or a broadcast deal, we plan on having video on demand on Amazon and Apple. Um, and, and we're investigating a possible, like a, maybe like a fathom events okay. or like a, you know, limited theatrical run across the country. So these are all, I mean, we just finished the movie. I mean, like it went to a DCP, like, which is yeah. like, you know, the way you play at the big movie theater. It went to that last week. So. We were just doing financial reconciling. I mean, if I turned the camera that way, you'd see receipts spread all over the tables. Like, we're re reconciling all our finances, and, and that's why our producer's here. And, um, you know, we're, we're actively still making the movie. But you will be able to see it. I promise everyone's saying, when can I see it? When can I see it? And it's like, we will make sure either you can rent it, you can stream it. It'll be in a theater or it'll be on TV. We'll Any one more time, can you hit the social media? Because I want people to know, you know, if the premiere comes near them, they can see it. Our okay. Instagram is at xbii.films. And our Facebook is okay. Make Peace and I'll, I'll put some remarks. Um, films, I'll yeah. put some remarks on the YouTube no, as well. So you guys can click on the links and stuff. Pause. And why don't we go ahead and show all the viewers your trailer and put that out there. And then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene on the back end of it. So here we go. Everybody check out the trailer of I uh, Make Peace of Die 17. I never thought this would be the path that I would take. They're no longer here to speak for themselves, so somebody has to. Feels like a lifetime ago. And then just like yesterday, I guess. I was a young kid that was like gung ho to go. You want to like fight, and then sometimes it happens. Did it happen for you? Yeah. Those play thighs everywhere. They planted that hoping they're going to go there. In 2011, our unit was deployed to Sang in Afghanistan. I was a dog handler, I had a bomb dog. I knew it was a dangerous job because your main focus is looking for IEDs, roadside bombs. Four. Our motto is make peace or die. We're talking to the enemy. We're telling the enemy, be peaceful or we'll kill you. You just saw your best friend get shot or get blown up and you're not allowed to grieve until you go home. We had 17 Marines that were killed. I came back a completely different person. You have to figure out ways to deal with things. First four years after I got out of the Marine Corps, I feel like everything I did, I did for myself. Not even realizing that the Gold Star families were struggling as well. I was trying to figure out, well, what could I do for the families of those 17 Marines? 
It just came to me and I was like, well, I should do a carving of the image of the Battlefield Cross. I would just reach out to the Gold Star families and tell them I would like to present them with one. I don't know if I'm ready to do this, but I can't wait any longer to do it. It was nerve wracking because I didn't know how one family would react to the other one. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life is have to face those families. They all say we're just afraid he'll be forgotten. No lo vamos a recuperar, a superar nunca, porque para nosotros va a ser nuestro hijo toda la vida. I didn't want life anymore. I didn't want to do it anymore. It's like, how do I do it? I was out trimming the bushes. I looked at the shears, and I wanted to just ram them through me and be done. During that time, we went to 34 different states and drove over 12,000 miles. We interviewed 23 different Marines. I almost questioned if what I was doing was the right thing to do because I felt like I was bringing the families more pain than healing. Yeah. I'm tired of feeling this way. Like tired of being like in the low point or just feel like I'm lost. There was two times I put a gun in my mouth. How you feeling today? <laughs> Losing a piece of me. I'm getting to say goodbye to her properly. All these families, they, they lost their son and like they didn't get to do that. I have to be strong because these families are so strong with the grief that they deal with. The first time I met Anthony, all I did was hug him. <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't want to let him go. It's like having one of his brothers here with me. And it seems so insignificant in a world so big, but it means the most to the one person who lost that little bit of the world. What you're doing, it's not just working for the families, it's working for the guys that know of you from being there, and it makes a big difference. You know this make peace or die thing, and when we're talking to the Marines, I think part of this mission is we have to help these guys make peace or they could die. Do you feel like you're making peace? Yeah, I'm trying to. Very impressive uh, trailer. Well done, Manny and Anthony. Uh, the whole film is going to be obviously that times 10, which is going to be an amazing thing for us to see. Um, so, Anthony, I know that you had mentioned something um, earlier about a uniform that's going to the National Museum of the Marine Corps. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, one thing we did is when we were on the road, we collected a piece of uniform item of a dress blue uniform from all 17 Gold Star families, and it makes one, uh, one complete uniform. Uh, we assembled it in-house, and then we donated that uniform to the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Triangle, Virginia in March of last year. And uh, we're still going to work with the museum to try to get it as a permanent display uh, with one of the carvings as well. So that's something, I mean, that the head curator for the museum said, no, but like we have a lot of museums in our collection, but we, I believe this yes. is one of the most important uniforms just because of what it signifies. A lot um, of uniforms. In the yeah, there's a lot of uniforms in the collection, but this will be one of the most important uniforms because of what it signifies, how it's pieced together. It's a piece that belonged to each of the guys. The white, the blues belt, the white belt, uh, <laughs> McDaniels was wearing that in the casket, and his family gave us that. Uh, Joe Jackson, the, you know, I can, I can name off which piece belonged to which, which uh, Marine. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we had to make sure the highest, highest rank, uh, the highest uh, Marine that was killed was a staff NCO, Gunny Pate, so we had to use his belt buckle. We put gunnery sergeant chevrons on it, but the jacket belonged to Joe Jackson. You know, so we had to piece everything together. I had to ask the families for certain items to help complete the whole thing. And before I cut you guys loose, I know you're busy and you got your producer. Hey, thank you to the sir on, on the. I know you're sitting over there on the side. Appreciate you, all your effort. You know, to help these gentlemen make this film become a reality for these Gold Star families. Just such an honorable effort. Um, I'd like to afford you guys the opportunity, you know, to give a shout out to any family, friends, sponsors, anybody like that. Uh, you up first, Manny. 
Oh goodness! I mean, there's so there's so many. I mean, I mean, right now, I think we have to thank Wooden War Outdoors um, for all their help. Um, I think we would like to thank the Knights of Columbus too. They're doing a they're doing a story on Anthony um, in their upcoming magazine. Um, you know, uh, and and everyone everyone that's donated to the film, everyone that's invested, and 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 anyone who's just bought us a beer along the way, or or, or you know, shared shared a smile and a story with us. We appreciate it because it's been a long road. And, uh, and especially, I think, to our wives that let put up with us while we did this, <laughs> you know, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of work. Yeah, but, and to, Anthony, the, to, the, to the families, we, we are eternally grateful to them. You know? uh, I mean, I think he covered most of it. I, I want to say our investors as well. I don't know if he said that, but it, this that includes everybody that donated. It's been a lot. It's been, you know, we're, we're a small film crew. There's just the three of us. Um, we've hired different people to help us along the way. Uh, if we had needed bigger, you know, more cameras or doing a bigger shoot that day, like a Pendleton or, but, uh, you know, we're just a small crew, but it's been a big, a lot of support from a lot of people uh, and a big community that has helped us awesome. along the way. Yeah. Um, and we could have done it with everybody, without everybody. We, we could shout out the uh, Marine Corps media office too, because they helped us film at the museum and, and helped us arrange for Pendleton. We could not have had those scenes without the Marine Corps. Uh, gave us permission. They signed off on it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, I, w- I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go so far as saying they're promoting it, but they, they yeah. signed they, off on they it. They approved <laughs> on the footage we, we took yeah. at Pendleton and yeah. at the museum. So that was that their lawyers and everybody had to give us permission, and they we, we, we got that. So. Um. Appreciate the fact that you guys, you know, are keeping faith and taking action steps, you know, rather than just, you know, sitting on the sidelines. You guys are lions finding different ways to give back in different capacities. Um, this allows me, you know, to, to bring people on the other end of the camera so they can share their experience so other people can learn. Um, like your journey, Anthony, this actually has been very helpful to me too, you know, being a combat veteran and stuff and choking stuff down and putting it away and not dealing with it. This has been just a huge outlet for me, you know, to reconnect with people. And it just, it makes me feel, you know, like a, you find some purpose in your life. So I love this journey that I'm on and I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Hey, to left, right, left nation. We're going to close Thank it out here for the evening. Reminder, make peace or die 17. Be sure to follow these guys on social media. Uh, they'll be promote, uh, posting, you know, all the updates on it. Uh, be looking out for the stream and everything, but I'll ask you to go over there and, uh, and support their film. And indeed, you know, let's th- another part of this thing that's cool will be if everybody just kind of, re- you know, rekindles themselves, you know, gets themselves energized and motivated, reconnect with the veteran, reconnect with the gold star family, you know, that would be added value, you know, to finish this thing out. Hey, I appreciate everybody. Um, thanks for your continued support. And again, you know, it's been my honor, you know, to host the Marquez brothers this evening. And hope everybody has a great night. Till next time, take care.